I'm Terry King. I am the chief of the Division of Breast Surgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Dana-Farber Cancer Center, and um, the co-director of the BPREP program. BPREP stands for Breast Cancer Personalized Risk Assessment Education and Prevention. And so I'm just gonna give you a little uh, introduction this morning uh, about the program. Uh, so again, panelists, please uh, put yourselves on mute when you're not talking. Uh, all of our attendees, you are automatically muted, but please use the uh, chat function uh, for questions and we'll be monitoring your questions and we will have a live Q&A after each uh, speaker. And this session will also be recorded and we will post uh, the video to our website um, after the event. So um, if you want to come back and look at something again, uh, we'll have it there for you. If you want to share with your uh, family and friends, we'll have it there for you. So we have a, uh, we think a really exciting lineup for you this morning. We're gonna talk about many different uh, factors that are associated with breast cancer risk and uh, some strategies uh, that each of us can, uh, can do uh, to help to uh, reduce our risk. Before we get into that, I just wanna give you a little bit of uh, introduction into our, our clinic, our program and who we are. So the B Prep program lives in the Brigham and Women's Hospital Comprehensive Breast Center. And our breast center is really there for evaluation of uh, all variety of breast symptoms or breast complaints. Um, we do workups for abnormal breast imaging. Again, we evaluate uh, breast lumps, breast pain, um, anything that you're concerned about with respect to uh, the breasts. Um, we also, of course, um, evaluate women who are known to be at increased risk of breast cancer, um, including women with the high-risk lesions, which we'll talk about later this morning. Um, but we're also there to evaluate patients who want to learn about their breast cancer risk. Um, perhaps they have a family history or perhaps they were reading about information on dense breasts or other factors to increase risk. And our team is there uh, to help you understand your risk. This is just a little cartoon of really how our clinic uh, works. And so really all the, all the bubbles or all the balls coming into the funnel. Uh, lots of women come to us for various different uh, reasons. Everybody uh, completes a standardized risk assessment. Um, if there is certainly a, uh, a, a complaint or a problem, we wanna evaluate that and, and, and resolve it for you. And if our standardized risk assessment determines that you are at elevated risk for breast cancer, then we invite you to stay in our program, in the BPREP program, and return to us uh, annually or biannually for your surveillance and participate in options to reduce your breast cancer risk. And if you're not at high risk, then equally good, we want to reassure you that you're not at elevated risk and you continue routine screening with your physicians. So some of the uh, categories that we are looking for that uh, increase a woman's risk of breast cancer that would be um, an indication for follow-up in our BPREP program is certainly a family history suggestive of or, or of a known genetic predisposition. Uh, genetic variants of uncertain significance are also uh, patients that we are interested in, in following and helping women to understand uh, what those variants mean. Women have had a personal history of radiation to the chest before the age of 30 are at elevated risk for breast cancer. Again, women who have had a breast biopsy showing a high-risk lesion, which we'll talk about later this morning. And then we do use risk, predi risk prediction models, excuse me, to try to help, women, help estimate uh, women's risk of breast cancer. None of these models are perfect, but they can provide uh, some framework and guidelines for us to talk about uh, different options for different levels of risk. And again, we've heard a lot about dense breast tissue, and we know that that is a risk factor, and so we're here to uh, help those women as well. And our program is really a partnership with our Dana-Farber Cancer Institute Genetics Group. And you'll hear from a couple uh, members of that group uh, throughout the morning. This is um, just a snapshot of our team. It is a multidisciplinary team uh, with the patients in the center. Um, again, we have uh, collaborators uh, from our clinical genetics and pre prevention program, Dr. Bishkovsky and Dr. Garber and Dr. Scheib. We have an internist, Dr. Pace, who works with us. She has a particular interest in breast cancer risk. Um, Mary Beth Hans is my uh, co-clinical director of, of the BPREP program, a physician's assistant with over 20 years of experience in uh, breast assessment and breast disease. Uh, similarly, Mary Gretchen is a nurse practitioner who is a, a critical component of our program. Again, over 20 years of experience in evaluating women with breast uh, complaints and breast symptoms. 
Susie Tsai is a newer member of our team and other uh, physician's assistant. Um, and then you see below Eileen Joyce, a critical member of our social work team who's been with us throughout the development of this program and will share with you some tips on mindfulness towards the end of the session. And then one of our newest members, uh, Allison, is our patient navigator and she's really there to help us help our patients uh, keep, uh, keep on top of their recommendations and make sure that we are meeting uh, all of our patients' needs. So we're there uh, every day for our patients and we do this for them annually. Um, but we also try to connect with you throughout the course of the year in the form of uh, emails and new newsletters, uh, getting the latest information out to you, uh, tips, things that you can do again to um, help take charge of your own breast cancer risk. We really are about our patients. We do this for our patients. And I just want to highlight for you here, this is uh, Mill Neopold. She was one of our first patients in the program, uh, graciously participated in one of our research protocols. And she actually was a speaker in our 2019 forum. And her video is on our website. And I really encourage anybody who's interested to watch Mill's video. It's very uh, powerful. And uh, really, it is why we do what we do. So just uh, briefly before we get on to the, the main event, I just want to share a little bit with you about, you know, what are we talking about? What does it mean to be at increased risk for breast cancer? Well, what that means is that your chance of developing breast cancer is higher than the average woman. We know that the average woman's risk is about 12%. So 12 out of 100 uh, women uh, will develop breast cancer in their lifetime, women without any specific risk factors. What does it mean to develop breast cancer? Well, if this is a cartoon looking at the, the breast tissue itself. The breast tissue is a series of milk glands and milk ducts all going to the nipple for breastfeeding. The normal milk duct is a, a hollow tube just lined by a single row of, of cells that all look the same. When a breast cancer begins, one of these cells goes bad for whatever reason, divides into two bad cells, and those two continue to divide and divide and so on. And you see in the middle panel, when those cells stay with inside the milk duct, that's when we call it pre-invasive or in situ carcinoma. And then when those cells start to break through the wall of the milk duct and get out into the fatty tissue of the breast, that's when it's called invasive cancer. And so cancer is really a group of diseases that is characterized by uncontrolled growth and spread of abnormal cells. And so when it comes to breast cancer, we know that there are many risk factors uh, for breast cancer. And, and I'm sure you've heard of many of these. Uh, when you go to your physician's office, they ask you how old you were when you started your period, how old you were when you went through menopause, ask, asking you about family history, et cetera. We have learned a lot over the last two decades about genetic risk for breast cancer and inherited mutations. Uh, we used to primarily just talk about BRCA1 and BRCA2, but now we know that there are many other genetic mutations, and you'll hear more about this uh, later this morning again from Dr. Uh, Garber. We, again, coming back to those sort of reproductive or hormonal factors, these are softer risk factors, but they do sort of all come together to help uh, evaluate a woman's risk. And these are the factors that go into these risk prediction models um, that we use in the clinic. And this is just sort of a, a snapshot of how these uh, factors are put together and the models predict a woman's five or lifetime breast cancer risk. Now, none of these models are perfect. They all have their own limitations. And we also have to remember that these models do not account for race and they do not account for lifestyle factors. And so again, this is just a, a starting point to start our discussions about risk. These models are not specific for, uh, excuse me, are not perfect to tell you your individual risk. So our goal is awareness and education and to help women understand their options. It is a very personalized approach. So we want to uh, help you understand what your risk is and what seems acceptable to you. Is a 20% lifetime risk acceptable to you? Does that feel too high? Are you ready to do something about it? And again, with a big focus on lifestyle changes, diet and exercise, of course, with help and support. And then there, we also have medications, and you'll hear about those later this morning, and clinical trial options, again, all geared towards helping you reduce your risk. If you are motivated to reduce your risk through lifestyle changes, we do know that weight loss for any postmenopausal woman who is overweight does reduce risk. You'll hear more about that connection this morning. 
diet and exercise are certainly important interventions, not only for our breast cancer risk, but for many other uh, health conditions. And realistic moderation of alcohol use is also likely uh, to reduce risk. So last year at this forum, we spoke a lot about uh, how exercise um, is important in reducing breast cancer risk. And again, I draw your attention uh, to our website where our, the video, which really focused on the benefits of exercise and how much exercise we should be doing uh, is available. Um, also, if you come to our program, again, we talk a lot about exercise and uh, what is the appropriate amount of exercise for an individual. You'll see a little bit of putting these words into action with an exercise demo. Um, a little bit later this morning, Nancy Campbell, our exercise physiologist, who's been with us now for several uh, years in our, in our forum, uh, will we'll show you some very simple things that you can do uh, even uh, throughout your day uh, to keep yourself active and uh, moving. We are also very excited um, this year to welcome uh, Dr. Caroline Apovian. She is the co-director for the Center for Weight Management and Wellness in the Division of Endocr Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Hypertension at Brigham and Women's Hospital. She is a, a new a member to our forum, and uh, we're really looking forward to her uh, teaching us more about the link between being overweight and breast cancer risk. And then we'll also have a, a small demonstration of, of, a, healthy, of a healthy snack. Um, we want to make this interactive. We want you all to take away uh, some tips uh, from our forum this morning. And uh, Hannah Dalpias is here with us again. She is a senior clinical dietitian and will share with us um, this, what looks like a very yummy muffin tin uh, frittata. So again, our goal at Prep is to really match your unique risk profile, we are all unique individuals with realistic, practical, and acceptable lifestyle changes or interventions uh, so you can take charge of your breast cancer risk and, of course, opportunity to participate in clinical studies because this is how we move the field forward. We're not going to have a speaker specifically on dense breasts this morning, so I just wanted to share with you a few thoughts about dense breasts. We, again, hear a lot about this in the lay press. Breast density is how your breasts look on mammogram. It's not how they feel. It's not uh, whether you feel lumpy, bumpy or not. It's how they look on a mammogram. And there are four categories of breast density as you see fatty breast, uh, D1, all the way to extremely dense, D4. And most women are in the middle with this scattered fibro fibroglandular density or heterogeneously dense breasts. It's important to remember that it's really only this extremely dense category, this category four, that, in, that increases an individual's risk of developing breast cancer. So if you're in the middle, in the, the two to three range, which most people are, your density is not a significant risk factor for you. But if you are a four, that is a risk factor. And when we look at how much does that increase a woman's risk, again, if we go back to that average risk where 12 out of 100 women will develop breast cancer in their lifetime. If we give those 100 women extremely dense breasts, then we can see that up to about uh, 19 or maybe 20 of those women will, are at risk of developing breast cancer in their lifetime. So that's what we mean by a risk factor. It increases the number of women who are just like you that will develop breast cancer, but it doesn't mean that we know that you will develop breast cancer. Also these high-risk breast lesions, uh, atypical duct hyperplasia, atypical lobular hyperplasia, and lobular carcinoma in situ. We're going to hear more about these this morning from our uh, pathologist, Beth Harrison, who's joined us. Some of these lesions require surgery and others do not. She'll share some of that uh, science with us. When we are concerned that a lesion needs surgery, what we're concerned about is that there might actually be a cancer in the breast associated with that lesion. And so we call these lesions high risk uh, because there may be a chance of being associated with the cancer. And that's when we recommend surgery. But some of these lesions also carry a risk of breast cancer in the future over a woman's lifetime. And that is, again, a reason to be followed in our program to help you understand your future risk of breast cancer uh, as conferred uh, by these lesions. Again, how much risk do these lesions impart? Well, they vary depending on which high-risk breast lesion you've been diagnosed with. Again, comparing to the average woman, average risk is 12 out of 100 women will develop breast cancer. 
100 women with atypical ductal or lobular hyperplasia. Again, about 15 to 20 of those women will develop breast cancer. And lobular carcinoma in situ, a little bit higher risk, about 20 to 25 women out of 100 with lobular carcinoma in situ will develop breast cancer. And so you can see, again, different levels of risk and different opportunities for discussing risk-reducing risk -reducing strategies. What we do know about the risk of breast cancer conferred by these high-risk lesions is that our medication options, our chemo prevention, works very well in women who are at elevated risk because of these high-risk breast lesions. This is just a simple graph showing you of a thousand women that we followed in a clinical program, the number that developed breast cancer with chemo prevention in the red line was much less than the number that developed breast cancer without chemo prevention in the blue line. And Dr. Biskofsky is gonna talk more about these medications for cancer risk reduction again later this morning. I mentioned in our clinic, we're interested in clinical research and studies to move the field forward. And so if you do come to see us, we may ask you if we can uh, draw blood or use some tissue from one of your breast biopsies uh, to further our understanding of breast cancer risk. We really are looking to um, help what women understand, but also help our, our clinicians and our investigators to have the materials that they need to 